Hello and welcome to season two of the previews. My name is Ray Sam Donkelholm, and for those of you who have been waiting for this long, welcome back. For those who are just starting, welcome. All right. In this show, if you guys don't know, it's an interview talk show where I interview like local filmmakers from around the area or people from like not around the area completely and have them preview like upcoming works or even like projects they've done before in the past so that way independent filmmakers have a platform for them to get their content to you, the viewers. And we're starting season two strong with Paul McElarney and Sam Hayes. Hi. Good to How's be here. How's it going? It's going great. Excellent. Great. Great. This is my first time in Drake It. Oh, awesome. Are you loving the city? Yeah, it's cool. I have a friend from Drake It though. Our right, word. His name is Khan. Khan. Uh, Mike Connolly, I think Mike his Connelly? full name is. Right, I just call him Con. All right, cool. Yeah, it's probably embarrassing. I don't know his full name. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure it's Mike Connolly, but yeah. now that I think about it, I've only ever called him Con. Mm. Hey, Con. <laughs> Shout out to Con. All right, so I've got to know, how did you guys get started in the industry that you guys got started in? Well, I got into filmmaking in general, I guess, in high school. Uh, my buddy Rex Hicks, he uh, made short little movies, and I started acting with him, and doing all that crazy stuff and then that led to film school and then that led to uh, you know just doing little crew jobs and what have you and you know I'm trying to focus on acting right now pretty much and uh, that's where I met Paul here is acting in his movie The Ungovernable Force but uh, I guess we'll get to that in a bit probably. Mm -hmm. I, um, I have no formal training in film or anything like that but I, uh, I've always been a writer. I've liked writing and when I realized that no one was ever going to produce any scripts that I wrote, I decided I'm going to just make them myself. So I, I'm self-taught plus, you know, taught by Nick Norman. I'm from the Nick Norman School of, of uh, Film. He's our cinematographer. Nice. And how did the Ungovernable Films get started? Like, who's, who makes up that group? That is, uh, Ungovernable Films is a film company that I started, a production company. Um, and it started because we were previously a company called Bloody Hammer Films and then that kind of fizzled out, you know, there's a lot of in-house issues and uh, we, I still wanted to make films obviously though, but I didn't want to use the Bloody Hammer name so I decided to do Ungovernable Films mm -hmm. and uh, I took along Nick Norman and Alex E. Edwards from Bloody Hammer Films and we also took on Dave Sullivan. So it's myself, Dave Sullivan, Alex Edwards, and Nick Norman are the four co-owners and the executive producers of all the films that Ungovernable Films makes. And Sam is one of our, our favorite muses. Mm. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> so like, what kind of films do you guys <clears throat> have under your belt currently? And Sam, which ones are you in? Um, I met these guys. I first auditioned um, for The Ungovernable Force. That was in uh, 2014, which I think is pretty much the first film produced under the ungovernable name. It is, yeah. Um, the Ungovernable Films presents The Ungovernable Force. Right. right. Very fitting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's where I got started with them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we did The Ungovernable Force, we, and then we did, I think the next one we did was Gay Jesus, mm -hmm. and then we did two super shorts, uh, Maul My Children, which is five minutes long, yeah. and Smoothie. And those two won't be seen until they're released on DVD because they're being, they're part of an anthology. Actually, they're part of two separate anthologies, which is 60 Seconds to Die, which are just a, uh, it's this guy, Tony Newton in England is making these horror anthologies uh, of just super short horror shorts by various horror directors around the world. And so the, the 60 Seconds to Die one was the movie that we did, we did Smoothie for it, which is just a super quick, no dialogue um, short about a guy that, uh, goes to get sexual favors and ends up getting killed, uh, and his gets turned his flesh gets turned into a smoothie and then he's forced to drink it. Um, and then Mall My Children is just this it's a rip on um, soap operas. It's about like a Sam plays the lead. Uh, he's um, secretly in love with his stepsister. Mm -hmm. uh, things start to happen. Okay. But then him being in love with his stepsister is the most normal thing that happens in Mall My Children. I would say. I'd say so. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and, then, well, and I'll say then we just finished uh, filming another feature mm -hmm. like two weeks ago we wrapped uh, called The Streets Run Red. All right, cool. Um, and yeah, we, we shot that in two weeks. Like we shot it from in, in, in a matter of 16 days we shot it. Hmm. What's that project about? Or I'm like we're not allowed to know yet. No, I can tell you. It's a, it's a serial killer film where um, uh, I'm trying to think of a... Uh, 
what I can and can't say about it. There's not, there's not really any twists, I guess. But it's a serial killer film where the serial killer is black because what, I, what we realize is that there's almost no black serial killers, at least not in, in fiction and very uncommon in, you know, in real life. And I'm sure that they're out there, but they're just not talked about for whatever reason. Right. Or maybe, maybe there isn't any black serial killers. I mean, who knows? I mean, there's the, the Washington, D.C. snipers were classified as technically serial killers but even that's debatable because they weren't doing it by a pathological urge to kill. It was, mm. it was for money and it was for, to cover up something else. Or Anyway, um, The Streets Run Red is about a, a black serial killer who is arrested on, for a different, much less serious crime. And while he's in holding, wait, awaiting to be bailed out, mm. the two detectives on his case are flashing back to all the times that they've uncovered evidence of his murders while he's sitting in his jail cell flashing back to those same murders and it just kind of plays along like that and Interesting. I'll, say, I'll say that much about it but it has a lot of the same people we that we had in the ungovernable force plus a lot of new you know awesome cast members and crew members all right gotcha but back to the ungovernable force what made you want to write a punk exploitation film i mean i grew up listening to punk mm -hmm. uh, i was in a punk band in high school it, I, I, you know, I've dabbled with every subculture that I've come across, and punk has always just made the most sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, I've also, I, I love films, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't make them. And so a lot of time I like to find films about punks or films that have punks in them. And for the most part, it, 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 it's, it's really done poorly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like Suburbia was great. Um, I like anything, pretty much anything by Penelope Spheres is pretty good. Yeah. And then like Class of 1984 yeah. is, is not accurate to punks at all, but it's a great movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, most of the time when punks are in a movie, they're not really punks. They're like Hollywood punks, which are, are, is equally cool subculture, but it doesn't really exist in the real world. Right. Um, like Robocop has Hollywood punks and mm -hmm. Class of 1984 and then... Um, the Demons movie has Hollywood punks. You know, yeah. the, Savage the guy, Streets. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But um, very few movies really do a good job at showing what the punk subculture is actually about. Like a lot of people think SLC punk is accurate, and it's so far removed from accurate that it's not even funny. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like like completely wrong, but it's just a terrible representation. Right. Um, so we wanted to do something that you know was a lot more realistic because I mean. We knew that we had a great crew and you know great actors, and we knew what we were talking about when it came to punk. So we were like, let's let's actually do a, a good punk exploitation movie. Right. Um, so we did it, and it, you know, it, a movie about punks has already been done once, and you know, with suburbia. So I didn't want to do it just about punk. So I was like, let's do something different with it. So we had a rapist fascist cop, uh, which is very fitting because it was right during the um, uh, what's it what's it called all the, all the, the anti cops stuff. Mm. What's that? The Ferguson incident. Ferguson and mm. the Freddie Gay, um, Gray stuff. Yeah. Um, so it was very fitting that we were doing that at the same time that all these you know, protests and riots were happening and the cops were killing all these unarmed black males and, and whatnot. And, um, and so we did that and then we added more to it. Like, all right, well, we need some, you know, some science fiction. So I'll, I'll say that there's some science fiction. I won't really say in what sense because mm -hmm. it's kind of a twist at the end. Okay. But uh, there's some science fiction involved. Um, and there's you know neo Nazis and there's politics and but it's all done through a very ridiculous absurdist you know exploitative you know filter right and like the elements of this film when I was doing like research on the ungovernable force um, you managed to get like Lloyd Kaufman uh, Debbie Roshan and Tony Moran like yeah. how did you manage to get these people to join your independent film um, I will also add to that in case I don't get a chance to. You know, say their names in any other respect. Mm -hmm. We also have Bill Whedon, oh. who was the bad guy in Sergeant Kabuki Man, Reginald Stewart, like one of my favorite trauma films. Mm -hmm. And we had Apache Ramos, who was uh, one of the a member of the gang, the Orphans, in the movie The Warriors. He's the one that says, uh, "It's gonna, we're, we're gonna rain on you, Warriors." And we had um, a lot of like big name punks in it. You know, the guy from Crass, Nine Nine Nine, uh, Zounds, Zilla Minx from uh, Rubella Ballet. And um, uh, I know I'm forgetting other people, but we had a, a lot of a lot of big names to us. Right. Um, I'm not saying that that you you made a mistake by not bringing that up, but I just didn't want to not mention them. Yeah, of course. Like as many people as yeah. like people like who are involved in the process. Like I haven't seen it, but like I'm excited to. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm I'm counting on my mind to be blown. Uh, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Um, but anyway, back to your question. Um, we met 
We, so before we even did ungovernable films, we had another, like I said, produ Bloody Hammer films, and we had a feature film that we did through that, um, Honky Holocaust, which is an anti-racist, equally offensive uh, uh, exploitation film, mm -hmm. um, equally offensive to the ungovernable force and Streets Run Red and Gay Jesus, right. but with a good message, you know, anti-racism. Mm -hmm. um, so while we were finishing that, Lloyd Kaufman and Troma were doing uh, Return to Newcomb High Volume 1, the premiere at the Coolidge Corner Theater. Mm -hmm. So we went down there to A, watch the movie, and B, bring an audio recorder and try to get some voice, so, you know, voice acting from Lloyd Kaufman to throw in the movie so we could say, featuring Lloyd Kaufman, and not be, <laughs> and not be totally you know, full of crap. Right. So we, uh, we did that, went down there. He was totally gung-ho about it. But, um, and this is one of my favorite stories, luckily, lo Blessing in disguise, Nick Norman, you know, our cinematographer, one of the co-owners and producers was with us, and he was very drunk. He had just played a show with his band right before we went, so he was very drunk, and he um, was getting in Lloyd's face, and he was saying, like, Lloyd, watch, he had his, his phone out, he was like, watch the trailer to Honky Holocaust, you're going to love it, and Lloyd, it's like one in the morning, and Lloyd is very young at heart, but he is, he's getting up there in age. Right. Uh, you'd never know, but you know, I'm sure the guy needs to get a good night's rest every, you know, every once in a while at least. Mm -hmm. um, so he's like, I gotta go home, I gotta, I gotta go to bed, it's two in the morning, right. get out of my face. <laughs> but he's such a nice guy, and he's so uh, supportive of independent film that his way of saying get out of my face was, email me, tweet at me, I'll do whatever you want, just get out of my face. <laughs> so we got his audio recording, mm -hmm. and we put it in a Honky Holocaust, and of course we put up on the, you know, we build Lloyd Kaufman in, the and he has like a scream, and he says, oh, my balls, like at the end of the movie or something. Um, but then we took him up on it. We emailed him, we tweeted at him, all that stuff. And from there, our relationship has grown to, we then featured him um, you know, in person in The Ungovernable Force. Mm -hmm. And then we have him doing a 16 minute audio track in The Streets Run Red as wow. a football announcer, because it takes place on the same night as the Super Bowl. So a lot of the scenes, you can hear the game playing in the background. And so I had him do a 16 minute vocal acting track. We're gonna take the best parts and have it playing in the background of most of the scenes in the streets run red. Mm. Um, and then they, Troma, you know, not because we met him at the Coolidge, not because he was in Hockey Holocaust or the Young Government Force, but due to our relationship with him, and I'd like to think due to our talent, but who knows, uh, Troma ended up distributing uh, Hockey Holocaust. So it's now available on Troma Now, and then it's getting released on Blu-ray within a month or so. Awesome. Yeah. Does that and, answer your question? Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> and uh, one thing that actually really made me like think like, like, these guys have like a lot of talent right here, because you have like a certain saying about CGI that we're not allowed to say on public access, but all of the effects in your movie, and like I've seen like some clips of it and after they're like, like wow, you know, and I'm thinking like like this was done with no CGI. Like, can you like explain like why you refrain from doing that and staying practical? Do you want to take a stab, Sam? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think uh, you know, first of all, I don't think we're the only ones. I think there is kind of nowadays kind of a resurgence with practical effects, at least within the the horror genre. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been looking at CGI for what you know, ten years now, plus years, and. Uh, you know, I think there's a real thirst for, uh, you know, just old school practical effects. But, uh, you know, why we do it, I think, you know, there's just something about practical effects that's, it just, um, I think, evokes a stronger response. You know, even if it's something really crappy, like a watermelon, a watermelon getting smashed, you know, there's just something about, you know, flesh and blood and, you know, real raw material. I don't know. This is making sense. Yeah, no, it to is. To me, to me, there's just something about it. It's just you know, even if it looks like crap, I would rather see a watermelon getting smashed than you know, some multi-million dollar special effect. Mm -hmm. It just you know hits you in the guts more. There's more of a a visceral response, and uh, you know, it just takes you out of the movie when you see something digital. At least that's my take on it, and right. uh, I think a lot of people appreciate a good practical effect. I totally agree with Sam. And um, for me, it's, it's hard for me to argue uh, against CGI um, to someone who doesn't make films. Um, even, though I, even, though if, even if I didn't make films, I'd still be just as much pro practical effects and against CGI. But it's, it's my main reason for not liking CGI is when I watch a movie and I see CGI in it, um, 
it, it, it takes away the fun for me. Mm. Part, of, part of enjoying a movie is, is guessing and trying to figure out and analyzing how they made it. Right. So when I see like, you know, a CGI, I mean, th my, the best example would be CGI blood splatter or CGI you know, gu gun flare, you know, muzzle flare, muzzle flash, whatever you call it, uh, when a gun is shot. Mm. And to me, it's like, you know, those are such easy effects to do practically, even though they won't look quite realistic. They definitely won't, don't look real when it's done with CGI. That, that aside though, because CGI is getting so good now that it does look pretty real and I will, I will give it that. Mm -hmm. But when I see it, even if I, don't, if I find out later that it was CGI, that's the worst because if I see mm -hmm. it, I'm like, oh, that's real. And then I'm like, oh, they, they just spent a ton of money on CGI and it looks real. Um, once I figure out that it's CGI, whether it's from looking at it right away or finding out later, it's not fun to me anymore. Like, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't get to kind of live vicariously through that filmmaker and imagine what it was like to be on set and try to make that effect work because effects is extremely difficult to get to look the way you imagine it. Mm. I don't think we've ever mm. pulled off an effect the exact way that, we, that I imagined it or whoever organized it and orchestrated it imagined it. Because I mean, I mean we've, we, we've, we've tried almost everything and I always am happy and sometimes really surprised and thrilled with how it came out, but it's never exactly how I pictured it, ever, ever, mm -hmm. ever, ever. I mean, we've devised, I once used a purse to try and make somebody's torso uh, and, and, and have it be spraying from all directions, and it did exactly what I wanted it to, but it didn't look as good as I expected. Right. Um, and, and, and that's part of the fun with it, is seeing mm -hmm. um, you know, people like Tom Savini like just do amazing effects and being like, that's what we're building toward, and see it, and, learn about how to use different materials uh, and latex and wax and silicone rubber and all these you know dyes and different ways of doing tubing and uh, squibs and I mean the whole, this is the whole list of things that we're that we've been doing for years and still just you know on the on the on the cusp of you know what I mean right mm -hmm. with CGI it, it has to do with how much money you throw at it mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean I'll give it I'll give it this with practical effects the same thing we could hire Tom Savini uh, if we had enough money we don't we right. probably never will. <laughs> and if we do, that's great. I can't wait to work side by side with him. But I don't want to shoot most of the scene and say, all right, you finish it off with your effects, whether it's, you know, especially if it's CGI. Right. But if it's, even if it's practical, I want to be involved in some way because that's, that's the fun of it is, you know, when film first started, mm -hmm. it was how do we get what we see in real life onto a film strip and then onto a screen and people can relive it. If you're doing all that at a keyboard with a, a miniature screen and then just, you know, using all these different, you know, zeros and ones to make this picture come out, is, does that really as fun as, as making miniatures or blowing something up in real life or having blood spraying and having to put the camera in a certain place and block some of your effects with act actors or props and stuff and just, you know, it's, it's way more mm -hmm. fun figuring out how to make something work in real life than on a computer where you can just hit delete and erase, you know, the effect. Right, that's half the fun is just the whole art of it is, you know, trying to make it look real. I mean, to me, it's, you know, if you're gonna make a live action film, then make a live action film. <laughs> right. If you use digital, to me, that's basically cheating. You know, hmm. maybe that's, you know, more of a purist take on it, but I think, you know, there should be limitations on the art, you know. If right. it's gonna be live action, then you have to go all the way, all or nothing, and, uh, you know, if the only way you can show a guy getting his head crushed is with a watermelon, then, you know, crush his head with a arm. That's the way to go. <laughs> right. And it, it just, you know, even if you know that's what it is, it just, you know, it just adds to the charm and adds to the entertainment. Right. You know, I mean, a, a perfect CGI human is just boring. You know, mm. I don't want to watch a video game. I want to watch a live action movie, you know. Right. So and that's my uh, take on it. I think that's it's really interesting that you mentioned like people getting smashed with like watermelons and blood spraying everywhere. Now, how do you just find people who are just willing to do that kind of stuff? I mean, first of all, <laughs> a lot of the stuff you see in movies, it's not as crazy to do as it looks. You know, mm. that's part of the movie magic. You know, um, you know, like nudity, for example. You know, a lot of people are kind of uptight about doing nudity, but you know, I just. Did the nude scene for the first time on a on Gay Jesus, and I gotta tell you, it's it's really not a big deal. I didn't think it was gonna be a big deal, but actually doing it, it's even more not a big deal than I thought mm -hmm. it would be. Um, and yeah, as far as other stuff, you know, getting blood sprayed on you, getting covered in blood is probably the worst thing. Yeah, that, I think it is. I mean, I mean, you see, if you watch, if anyone watches our films and they see the nudity, the 
apparent abuse of, of, of your body and yeah. all that stuff, mm. getting covered in fake blood is probably the worst. And that's what people are, think that they're the most okay with. Uh, I mean, do you agree? Because you, you're sticky all day long. Oh, yeah. Oh. Completely drenched in, in, in liquid, liquid sugar all day long. Oh. Yeah. There was a, a scene I did where, you know, I'm basically butt naked and I'm getting raped by these fascist <laughs> Roman soldiers. And that sounds bad, but, you know, honest, honest to God, the worst part of that scene was mm. the vinegar goop that <laughs> he sprayed all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> And ironically, you, you can barely see it in the right, actual I know, and finished it, product. And, but, that, and that's a great example uh, that, that ties us back into the practical effects uh, thing is right. you never know what's going to come out. You know yeah, I mean? that's part of the fun is, you know, not knowing, you know, mm -hmm. just like, uh, you know, if you worked with film, like actual film, there's always like that sort of, you know, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, is this going to turn out at the lab? You know, there's like this element of, of chaos. I think that's really, you know, part of the magic of, of making movies, mm. especially like these. It's that chaotic element. Right. Um, but aside from, aside from um, the actual act of, you know, the actual doing of any of these things you were asking about, finding the people is a lot easier. Mm. Um, it's easier to find them than it is to find a lot of them. I mean, I, that's probably obvious, but mm. it's surprising, you know, when, you, when we start to recruit people, um, I mean, we have a, a core group of actors and crew members who are all willing to do what we require of our cast and crew in every film, Sam being one of them. Um, we have, a, you know, the list is, is getting longer and longer with each film, but whenever we need fresh blood, we do a cast and call on Craigslist, a New England film, and sometimes you put it right in the ad this requires nudity. This is unpaid. If you're not if you're not okay with getting naked for free on film for everyone to see, don't respond. Mm. Um, sometimes we don't. Not all the roles require something you know nutty like like nudity or simulated sex or something like that. So we will wait till they come in and then we'll have a questionnaire. Are you okay with this? Are you okay with that? Um, a lot of times that questionnaire in and of itself filters out most people. I mean we've had. For, great, great example for Streets Run Red, the film we just finished. Um, the questionnaire was by far our most graphic. I mean, some people were more offended by the questions we asked them than they would have been by the film itself. Mm. Uh, but we, you know, we have to know. We don't, I don't want to all of a sudden get on set and find out, oh, they're actually not okay with this, whatever right. it may be. So we had one woman um, hear the questions asked. Turned around, you know, and walked out of the casting call in a rage. Saw a little girl coming into audition and warned her and her mother, "Do not go in there. They're going to make your daughter get naked and all this stuff." We would never do that to a kid. Yeah. There's kid roles that have nothing that aren't even remotely close to the stuff that we were asking about. <laughs> nor do we ask the kid that. Mm. So I mean, as much as our films are very graphic and we ask of our over 18 actors to usually do some pretty nutty stuff, I mean, we're 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 still pretty moral human uh, beings <laughs> you know as as many up things sorry to curse um as uh <laughs> as he asks you know his actors to do you know he'll he'll do anything he asks his actors to do mm, he's not cool. a, he's not a hypocrite right as a matter of fact he uh i don't know if you want, him, want me to mention this but uh <laughs> if you can say it without uh getting censored <laughs> go for it <laughs> i'll try not to curse again but no i mean he, he will and has done anything he, he's asked his actors to do. And as a matter of fact, uh, there was one scene in uh, a particular short where he actually had uh, Nick Norman, our cinematographer, ram a, uh, <laughs> a phallic device. A phallic device. Into an orifice that's into usually his, exit only. His, oh, uh, I'll say that. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> and, I was, and, here's the, and, and here's the thing is, I volunteered to do that. And I was the double for Sam. And I didn't even ask Sam if he was okay with doing it. So I won't say whether yeah. you were or were not. You can mm. say if you want. But uh, I said, Sam, I'm going to be your double because I need to. It's been a while since I've been on camera. And I need to ro remind everyone that I will do anything that I ask them to do. <laughs> right. And I, that might make people uncomfortable. I'll never know because I'm not one of them. But I like to think that people are like, oh, all right, he's a team player. Let's do even more crazy stuff. Okay, right, cool. Exactly. His sets are very comfortable, as far out as they might sound. They're they're actually very comfortable and, and very fun. Mm -hmm. well, comfortable all, aside from being sticky. Yeah, <laughs> ex except the scenes when you're covered in vinegar goop, mm. um, which I almost, I almost puked from that. There's two times on, on his sets where I've almost puked. 
one was uh, was that scene, and the other was <laughs> I had to uh, <clears throat> sort of operate the uh, the semen <laughs> that was coming out of his <laughs> severed penis. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's take it over to the Ungovernable Forest <laughs> preview, and we'll be right back after this. There you go, what am I gonna do? You don't trust me and I don't trust you. I bet you wish you did and I know I do. Why have you got tickets? Because I know you have. If you've got something to hide, then it must be bad. A change has got to come before too long, I know Peace has got to come and I could be wrong, I know But I just don't know Have fun with your freaks I was going to invite you to my parents' beach house this summer F*** your parents, you c*** And f*** your beach house Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that preview of The Ungovernable Force. Paul, Sam, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And Thanks. here on the previews, we want to make sure that filmmakers can network with one another. So I just want to know what's like the best way to get in contact with the two of you to get in on any kind of projects, film, acting, anything. You go first, Sam, because I'm going to list all of our stuff. Yeah, um, you can find me on Facebook. It's Sam Hayes, H-A-Y-S. There you go. Okay. There you go. Uh, we, the best way to reach us is uh, email, through email. Uh, we're at ungovernablefilms at gmail.com. Our website, which is, has all of our links and everything, is ungovernablefilms.com. has all of our movies that are available uh, to be seen online and trailers and clips and whatnot um, on that website. Also on YouTube, Ungovernable Films. On Facebook is Ungovernable Films. Twitter is ungovernable FLM because we couldn't fit, fit the I and the S. Okay. Uh, we're on Instagram, Tumblr. I don't handle any of that, but my fiance does and she's great at it. So we're always posting new stuff. And um, I think that's it. Ungovernable Films. Just search Ungovernable Films. You'll find us. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And we can't wait to see you guys next time on the previews.